So the first case is a five-year-old male, no complaints, neurological intact, provocative tests are negative, being the Buddha pose, heel walking, toe walking, etc. The MRI of the thoracic spine shows a syringomyelia cavity centrally located, extending from T8 to the conus, skinny, measuring only 15% of the core diameter, it is max girth, and the conus is at middle two. Petra, what do you do? I understand the... Okay, are the microphones on? We need all these microphones on. Tap it, tap it on. No, not yet. This one's working. Ah, oh, this one. So I understand the child is neurologic, uh, has no symptoms. No symptoms. Inci incidental finding, correct? No, neurologically intact. Yeah. So I would um, counsel about um, the possibility of idiopathic uh, syrinx versus uh, occult telecord and would uh, monitor. Um, uh, do another MRI in 6 to 12 months to follow up on the syrinx and um, uh, observe closely for potential development of tethered cord syndrome. Very good. Cormac. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with Petra. This uh, would never cross my mind to operate on this. Um, so patient is essentially completely normal and you, completely can't, normal. you can't fix normal. The, the trick here is that um, these are not, yeah. uh, you know, trap cases or whatever. These right. are just clinical scenarios we're going to encounter. So I can't think of a way you could make this patient better with surgery. So again, no, no surgery would be indicated, at least for me. Uh, primary syringomyelia that's thin, that's in the thoracic spine, has an excellent natural history. It doesn't, frankly, bother me that much that it's there. Okay. Monica. I would observe this patient also, and I'm not sure why he got the scan unless he found it on, you know, some other, for some other reason, since there's nothing wrong with him. But um, I would routinely, if I find a searing cell, image them one more time and maybe six to 12 months. If it's unchanged at that point, then I just tell the patient's signs and symptoms to watch for them. If they develop those in the future, follow up. Okay. But I don't routinely follow them every year. I'll follow them with one imaging study. Very good. Yeah. Dr. Reke, I had to add that the parents of the child are Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> that was so mean. <laughs> that was so mean because my, my answer incurs uh, 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 that these are intelligent enough to answer the question, to listen to the questions. That's a, that's a, that puts me at a terrible disadvantage at the moment. Um, I, wouldn't, I would spend a lot of time talking to the families about the fact that we operate on people, not on MRIs. And that there is, if there is no reason if they're not worse, if there's not a new symptom, it, I would not, the, the idea of getting a routine follow-up MRI scan scares the hell out of patients. It, it, it's, they, they dread it. They, they, um, it's, you know, it's always right the day before Christmas because their, their, their insurance is going to, their co-pays are going to get bigger after that. So you're, if you're going to give bad information, bad news, it's going to be right up the day before Christmas. Tick tock, tick tock, you have one minute. Well, fine. So the answer is, to, to patients, you explain it to them, and then you say, these are the things to look for. Come back if, they get, if you hear them, and I never get another study. And they also had an NRA card. Okay, second case. <laughs> Monica, go to the second case. Number two, 16-year-old female, severe low back pain, intermittent toe walker, sporadic urinary incontinence. New exam, there is some mild hyperreflex in both legs, decreased rectal wink at pinprick, provocative test, there is some urgency while heel walking, improved by, diet, by toe walking. MRI of the lumbar spine, there is an egg-sized focal central syringomyelia cavity from T11 to L1, stretching the outside of the spinal cord. The conus is a middle two, the phylum is thicker, and placed posteriorly. Okay, Dr. Reckett, you have the microphone, go first. Yeah, I'd schedule that child for surgery and do a detethering. I'd okay. make sure that I did it higher than usual so I could take the uh, phylum terminality and send it to pathology to make sure that the that I get it right, that there's a, that this, the central canal comes all the way down into the, into the phylum, but it always does. So just to, it's like the ep old appendix story, you, you send it to pathology so that you can confirm what you thought was the case. I would call this a, 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 um, 
it's terminal ventriculosity. And I in, would in that case, you don't burn the file on you, right. you just cut it, okay? Right. Monica. I would cut that phylum also. Okay, Cormac. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's as much as, as I try to be careful with these sorts of decisions, I think this vignette is written in such a way that it's sort of making everything perfect for a, uh, yes, it's for just, a, a just patient who's going to have a phylum cut. <laughs> um, so yeah. I probably feel a little bit bad about it, but I would do it. <laughs> okay, Peter. Uh, I agree with the surgical approach. I would just add like a... In those excised syringes, I'm always doing a contrast just to make sure that there's nothing. But I would have said it. Yeah, okay. Uh, and I uh, would also go higher uh, in this uh, case. Stay higher. Yeah. Okay. Case number three. Eight female, sporadic back pain, intermittent toe walker, chronic bad weather. That means that every week has it at least a couple of times. Sporadic, you can pass the, the computer around. Sporadic urinary incontinence during straining. Neurological intact. Urgency with heel walking. Improved by toe walking. The conus is a middle two. The phallum is thicker and placed posteriorly. So, Petra, go first. Yeah, case three. I'm suspicious of um, um, uh, tethered cord uh, syndrome here. Um, I would offer urodynamic testing um, and take it from there. So I think this vignette was written uh, in such a way as to be, I think, deliberately controversial. Um, so this is one where uh, where I would be uh, uh, very uh, cautious uh, before untethering this person. The symptoms uh, for me are, really, really are not specific loud. enough uh, to justify it, uh, although I, I recognize that some on this panel would. Monica? I'd be suspicious on her, but I would watch her a little bit more. I don't, it doesn't look to me like, you know, her, her enuresis is mostly Nighttime. Uh, I don't know how sporadic the daytime incontinence is. It sounds like it's stress incontinence. Very sporadic. Just every like every week, a few drops. Nothing bad. Yeah, and I would try. Um, it's an intermittent. She's an intermittent toe walker. She's not one that's getting worse over time. She may be coming out of it. Uh, back pain. If it's sporadic, the back pain I look for is something that's really significant and, and limiting the kids' activities. Um, I would follow her a little bit longer, maybe have them try some anticholinergics and watch her a little bit. She'd be one of those ones that I that watch a, a while and see what yeah. happens. Uh, it, if it's tethered, it'll declare itself over, over time as they grow. Uh, Some I, of these I stress again that the intention is not to, uh, to say this is the way to do it so we know that each other, et cetera. These are just the, even if they are hypothetical, this, the spectrum of uh, possible scenarios. So the patients know from their perspective, many of these patients here have been recorded and operated on, and their impression of the world is whoever has record needs surgery. Here we want to give the flavor is that there's a big world out there with many degrees of, with shades of gray. Also, Dr. Reckate, uh, sorry. Ultrasound or a bladder ultrasound might be helpful in this kiddo too to make sure there's no bladder wall they can yeah. hear bladder. Yeah, it's part of the, the process is, it's not only surgery or no surgery, it's also if you want additional things, just right. stay in the minute. Yeah, Dr. Reckate. Go slowly into that good night. I would not, uh, I would see that, uh, I would see that patient again I would uh, say, how has it affected uh, um, uh, her life? Um, if, she's, if she's in the situation that Monica described before, that uh, she smells of, of urine at, in school, and then she's getting near a prom time, I'd probably, uh, I'd probably be willing to, to do it just to, to, just to see, but I would wait a while. I'd, I'd follow that child fairly long time. Case number four. This time he's not a child anymore, he's 20. She's 20, it's female. Severe cochigeal pain. Neuro exam is normal. Provocative tests are equivocal because both heel walking and toe walking and the Buddha, the, obviously the Buddha for sure, they aggravate the cochigeal pain. 
The MRI of the lumbar spine shows corners of the L3-4, thick fatty phylum. Uh, there is no broken coccyx, there is no sublux coccyx on the x-ray, they left it out. Dr. Reckitt first. Um, uh, I, I, <laughs> I have to, you know, have, assuming that I agreed with all the what you just said uh, after a, a significant discussion with her um, and review of things, I'd, I'd, I'd probably, uh, this is one that I think we have to make sure that the aerodynamics made some, some sense. But my likelihood is very high that I would uh, do a detethering on her. Yeah, there are no urological symptoms at all, just coccygeal pain. Monica. I would, I would do this one because you've got a radiographically apparent tethered cord at L3-4 and you've got a 20-year-old with severe coccygeal pain. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it's, they don't always have bladder symptoms is the most common, but, but a lot of times it is just pain. and. You know, well, the chance of helping her is really high with a cord at L3-4. Cormac. Yeah, I agree. She has objective evidence of a tethered spinal cord. She has pain. Pain's a common symptom, and pain does get better with, uh, with untethering. So this isn't uh, very controversial for me. If on exam her pain seemed consistent with tethered cord type pain with provocative maneuvers and bending and so on, then I don't think I would... Uh, uh, be too distressed about teth untethering this person at all. Better. Uh, yes, I would also offer teth detethering, but I want to just add a reason because um, we are also seeing a lot of like later, like adult onset um, uh, tethered cord patients that are in their 40s, 30s, or 50s, which those are the ones that have a low, low lying corners and like classical radiographic evidence of tethered cord, and they do do get symptomatic later on and. Uh, um, I would uh, uh, guide the patient in this direction of a surgery. And just, just to that point, I know we talked a lot about kids, uh, but a lot of the adult patients get symptomatic when they get pregnant, mm -hmm. you know, with the exaggerated... Well, the next ones. Oh, all right. Go ahead. <laughs> so we go to number five. 28. You, you, did you read ahead? Okay, EDS hypermobility type, status post three vaginal deliveries. History of severe growing pains in childhood, severe low back pain, stress incontinence, intermittent spontaneous incontinence, urgency, dysuria, uh, for whoever there's no urgency is, oh geez, I gotta go, and dysuria, you go in the bathroom and it doesn't come out that well and yet, to, yet you struggle doing it. Frequent UTIs. Your exam, slightly decreased reflexes in the legs, provocative test, urgency with heel walking, improved by toe walking, spina bifida at L5 on the x-rays, conus middle two, vertical orientation of the conus like a plumb line. Petra first. Um, well, for me that's a surgical case. Um, I see the bladder dysfunction. I certainly do a urodynamic study, um, but uh, the clinical symptoms are compelling, uh, her stress incontinence. So even if the urodynamics are vague, I would offer surgery. Um, uh, again, here, particularly with the hypermobility type, the radiographic findings uh, rarely show uh, and lead, guide you. Cormac. So this is one that I would worry about. The patient has a comorbidity of a connective tissue disorder, has uh, a lot of really nonspecific uh, findings and, and symptoms, unfortunately. Severe growing pains, I don't think I would take into account uh, very much with a surgical decision. Uh, low back pain uh, in this patient, also very, very nonspecific. The decreased uh, bilateral lower extremity reflexes, even acknowledging that that was uh, was found are, are unfortunately not very helpful by themselves because they're not a specific uh, neurological finding. Uh, and then, of course, the, a relatively uh, normal uh, MRI scan. We could debate what this plumb line means. Uh, but uh, frankly, this is one that I'd, I'd uh, be very reluctant to do, at least uh, on first meeting her. Um, uh, I suppose there are things like the prone supine MRIs and, and other testing that could be done to maybe convince me, but based on the provided information, I would not. Okay, Monica. 
She's a she's a tricky one too because um, you know she's got all of the the past pregnancies and so you know anybody who's had a bunch of kids will tell you you can start to have the stress incontinence and all those issues mm -hmm. after multiple pregnancies. The back pain I'd need to know a little bit more about that. Uh, what you know a little bit better description of it. Um, the uh, reflexes being a little down. I put a lot of weight in reflex is, you know, comparing upper and lower extremities, you know, upper extremities to lower, if there's a, a big difference there. Um, yeah, when I say decreases, they're, they're less than the upper. Yeah, usually. And so, um, and she does have the spina bifida. The conus is a little on the low normal side. The thing about her that bothers me a little bit is that she didn't have any symptoms in childhood. You know, most of these kids that become, or people that become symptomatic uh, in adulthood at least had a little bit of difficulty with potty training, had accidents for a while. Um, sometimes not though. And, uh, and like we were saying, or as I started to say earlier, a lot of patients will become symptomatic when they get that hyperlordosis with pregnancy as they're, because that increases the, the length. We see that with CP kids too sometimes yeah. as they get more spastic. Dr. Rickett. As, uh, um, this is really fascinating. I, when I, I, I would, uh, my thoughts about these things have changed dramatically since I've been in, 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 uh, in New York. Um, uh, Dr. Millerat, Dr. Bolognese, and Dr. Kula. You're part uh, of the cult. What? You become part of a cult. Oh, God. <laughs> um, they, we screen patients with a, with a screening tool that contains a huge number of uh, possible yes-no answers um, that were d designed, and I'm not sure who gets credit for it, but it's been brilliant. And uh, you find, you find uh, things that go together that you never thought of as together all the time. And um, this is another reason why I'm glad I'm a man and not have had to go through childbirth or uh, <laughs> those, those sorts of things. But urogynecology, which is a fairly new specialty, those people must be frustrated all the time, not as frustrated as the women who have it, but what is causative and what is involved in the, in the, in the problems of uh, urinary control and, and urinary function in, in, in women, especially women who've had more than one pregnancy, is so complicated, and I cannot predict the outcome of, of these patients. I would, be, uh, I would have to be led uh, kicking and screaming uh, to the operating room uh, to, to do a tethered cord on, on, on this, this patient. But I would sure like for her to get good care from, from the urogynecologists uh, and things like that. And a CINE, uh, I've found the CINEs over the years to be more and more helpful, the dynamic studies, because sometimes it is, it's obvious that that cord is really stretched and isn't moving. And, and you know, that I don't really use them as a deciding factor unless they're so obvious that there's something going on. Because a lot of times you'll see a little bit of restriction of movement, but sometimes they're really, really tight. But again, the thing about her that bothers me is that she didn't have anything as a kid. Yeah. Most of them had something as a kid. Dr. Eckert was uh, just mentioning the screening tool. The screening tool was is a single page with 20 to 22 uh, points, a mix of uh, symptoms and signs, and the results of provocative tests, which are all related but not exclusive of uh, tether cord, and they provide a sort of a eagle's view of how Im how compromise the patient is and we had defined as hotter spots on the on the page things which are more important to us and softer spots on the page the reason why that form was was built is uh, didn't come out of uh, out of intelligent design it came simply because Dr. Mirat was getting very frustrated about looking for all these individual pieces of information in the chart and generally at 7 o'clock in the morning he was very grumpy and then he was getting grumpy at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and then he was getting mellow at 7 but at 7 you know at that point you already had enough of his grumpiness so we put together that page as a sort of a uh, just to let, make him less gram grumpy so there was no intention design then afterwards we realized oh geez like he's much easier now and say, hey, you see, I, I wanted that to happen. So he took the credit. 
number six, 10 year old EDS classical type, which means he's hypermobile and the wounds don't heal so well. Uh, lower back pain, numbness underneath the soles of the feet, feels heavy in both legs, but there is no objective weakness. Urinary and fecal incontinence, neuric and is constant, like it has multiple times a week. Decreased rectal tone, mildly decreased reflexes in the legs. Chief complaints worsen with heel walking and they're improved dramatically by toe walking. The corners again is the middle two. Vertical orientation of the corners like a plumb line, Petra goes first. Yeah, again, I'm not looking at the MRI. Um, I mean, um, that, that uh, kid definitely has like lower leg symptoms, uh, uh, urinary uh, symptoms, and some findings in the neuro exam. I mean, I would certainly uh, work that kid up further with uh, urodynamic testing and uh, thoroughly check that kid out for elements of the clinical triad. But um, um, yeah, that should, child should be seriously to consider to be eventually be a candidate if things progress. Okay, Cormac. Yeah, I think this vignette's written in a way that uh, it could be or it couldn't be. Uh, but again, I take a generally cautious approach, at least at first. Um, some of the symptoms I take more seriously than others. Not that they're all not important to the patient, but some of them just are, are not specific enough for me, the so-called heaviness and so on. Uh, the urinary and fecal incontinence is, uh, is uh, obviously of great concern to the patient. This feels like something that I would send to uh, our urology department and probably never see back because they would just work with the patient and uh, most of these patients just get better. Or you'd never see them again. I just never see them again. Monica. All right. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I think this kid sounds to me like a pretty classic tethered cord. I mean, he's 10 years old. He's got bowel and bladder incontinence. No 10-year-old wants to be having bowel and bladder incontinence. You know, a lot of times people say it's behavioral, but what 10-year-old wants that kind of attention, you know? <laughs> and so I, by the time I've seen them, they've been usually been seen by uh, our uh, urologist and, um, and GI guys. A lot of times you can see urinary incontinence with bad constipation, so you have to be sure they've had bowel clean outs and the bowel's well controlled. Uh, but if, if he's got decreased rectal tone, I mean, it's hard to fake that, you know? I mean, that's gotta be something going on with that, and he's got decreased reflexes um, and uh, your conus is you know low normal at mid L2 so and I'm I'm sure he has spina bifida occulta on the x-ray and I'm sure he has failed conservative therapy I mean so all of ours have to fail conservative therapy I I'd, I'd have a hard time turning this kid away and not even trying you know even if the chance was 50 50 yeah, I'd have a hard time not it's trying really such a low morbidity operation with a kid having so much trouble Dr. Ricky. Yeah, I have a completely different idea of this. I, I consider tethered cord release to be extremely low morbidity operation uh, and therefore have a lower uh, threshold. Mm -hmm. However, in hypermobile EDS, it's not the same. They have terrible, um, uh, they have terrible connective tissues, and that includes the dura. Many of them you go in and you try to put a stitch in the dura and it makes a bigger hole and it makes a bigger hole and it makes a bigger hole and the chance of leakage, the chance of uh, herniation of the spinal nerve roots out through the, 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 the I, so I think that it's not so much that I disagree that, that the patient should be a candidate, but I would be very loath to just jump into this because I think the, more, the, the chance of having a complication in this particular patient is dramatically higher than it is in the normal population. You can't look at them the same. So everything is a matter of, of, of balancing risk and benefit. And um, while I think the benefits are clear, and I think the patient would get better from the surgery, I, I would have to um, make myself be certain that, it's, that, that there's no other option and that there's no other way of, of handling this because the, in the EDS population, the, the complication rate is, in my, my view, um, a lot higher than I would have ever expected because their dura is like wet toilet paper. You, yeah, must see these, more, you must see more of those EDS yeah. patients than we do. But no, what, what happens in EDS is that, that uh, the phylum is 
position posterior in, in, uh, in terra cord is described by Dr. Yamada and the, the dura should be like skin thick, or no, not exactly skin thick, but thick, you know, thicker than just a little piece of paper. And in EDS tends to be stretchy and more, more friable, hence the, toilet, hence the wet toilet paper stitching. The problem with the, the phylum terminale and the terracor surgery is that in adults, the phylum which is positioned posteriorly rubs against that posterior part of the dura. Wow. So it tints it to the point that when you go in, you just see through it, like a piece of saran wrap, and you see all your codequina plus the phylum, which is easy to see, looking at you, and it is good going in, but it feels bad coming out. So it mm -hmm. takes some different creative stitching to be dealt with. And number seven, 35, no longer a kid. Um, EDS classical type, moderate low back pain and some hesitation, urgency until three months ago. What happened three months ago? Craniocervical fusion. Then after that, bilateral lower extremity pain, soul's numbness, a sensation of pulling up and down the spine, Worsening urinary incontinence to the point that now is multiple times daily. Neuro exam that is pronounced but not brisk reflexes in all limbs. Provocative test. Chief complaints are worse with heel walking, improved by toe walking. The MRI is unimaginably conus at top of L2. Vertical orientation of the conus like a plumb line. Petra, go first. Well, so. There was just a surgery done three months ago. Yeah, uh, and the so patient fell off the cliff after that. Mm -hmm. The patient fell off the cliff? Yeah, no, not fell off oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the cliff. Tell the Germans it's just a figure of speech. <laughs> well, we take everything seriously. You, oh. you Germans are so concrete <laughs> thinkers. So, we didn't push I know you. That. Um, I would um, just make sure that post-operatively there is no, you know, not, not a complication. But I would tell the patient, three months is you have to recover from your first surgery. Uh, we'll have to at least wait six months, if not to a year, to see how your symptoms evolve. That can be like some change going on after the craniocervical fusion. Um, and uh, I wasn't going to do anything just yet. I want to stop a second and do a surprise guest. Fraser, come here. Did you see a case like this before? You had to talk in the microphone. One minute. Okay. Uh, well, first off, I would not operate on this patient. But uh, following, yet, yet, uh, following a craniocervical fusion, many patients actually get taller, and I'm not exactly sure why, but very often they're about an inch or even more taller. I think it's because of straightening of the spine. And so a number of these borderline patients suddenly become very symptomatic. Uh, personally, I require that patients have demonstrable neurological findings. And so I'd want to see more on the neurological deficit side before I operated on this patient, like Petra. The, is that one minute? Yeah, this is, no, no. The point, the point yeah. of for which I brought you here is yeah. just why this has happened after refusion. Okay, I think I, ex yeah. so, does that explain yeah, it? Yeah, it's a sort yeah. of a, sorry, you're pulling from the other part. Right. Sort of playing tug of war with the spinal cord. Right. So uh, let me emphasize then that following craniocervical fusions, patients do tend to get taller, and I think this does uh, place more traction on the spinal cord and bring out these tethered cord findings. Good. Thank you. Sorry for the curveball. Uh, okay, Cormac. So uh, no, uh, for me on this one, the, again, the main symptom is low back pain in somebody with a number of causes for low back pain, uh, urinary incontinence, not clear what the urological workup has been, uh, an exam that is uh, relatively normal and imaging that is more normal than not. So this is a clear cut no for me. Monica. I agree, you have to wait a little bit more time after the uh, surgery before you even start thinking about how long would you wait before thinking about it? I, I would wait at least six months to see um, things, what kind of recovery. If things come down again. Until things settle down, yeah. right. 
to Torrey Cade. Did you see like, this I don't before? like vignettes. I really, I really don't. I tend to talk to people a lot longer than I can possibly get the information from, from here. Did you and see so this So I have no idea what I would do until I actually talk to the patient. Yeah, but did you see this before, this scenario? I've seen patients get worse after, after uh, uh, usually it's with CSF dynamics. Uh, the, the change in the, in the CSF flow pattern, uh, it, it sometimes brings out uh, the fact that they have high intracranial pressure and uh, that, they, that they may have some uh, change in a lot of the things that happen. When you, especially when you have the brainstem involved in a, in a um, uh, is being spiked by the odontoid process and you take that spike off, then you open up, you can, it can open up Pandora's box in other ways. It, usually it helps, but sometimes it, it, it brings you questions you don't know the answer to. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass on this one because I, I, I need to really spend a lot of time with the patient and really understand what's going on and which is probably what, get which a Which is budget. what Monica was saying before, talking to yeah. the patient, getting more information. Uh, number eight, and this is the last one of the vignette. 32-year-old uh, EDS, classical type, female, lower back pain, restless leg syndrome, urinary retention, overflowing continence. Ultrasound, there is a large bladder, hydronephrosis, urodynamics, decreased bladder sensation, hypotonic bladder, reflux into the ureters towards the kidneys. Neuro exam, mildly decreased anal wink. Provocative test, chief complaints worsen with the walking, improved by the walking, conus, top of L2, plumb line, vertical orientation of the conus. Dr. Reckett goes first. Well, <clears throat> microphone. Uh, again, you know, uh, my mind is reeling too much uh, to be able to, to do these things. When I when I think of tethered cord, the the is it the sympathetic or the parasympathetic nervous system? What is it that's causing it? Is this an abnormality of the of the external sphincter or the internal sphincter, or is it the tetrusor? And um, and most tethered cord s surgeons, most tethered cord uh, result in small capacity um, um, bladders <laughs> with inability to start their urinary stream until they get uh, in the small capacity bladder, they get, they get, uh, um, they, they finally open up. Um, so um, it sounds more like, uh, you know, uh, this is, uh, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, Monica next. Uh, th yeah, this is a hard one too. But I would be more inclined to do her than I would than I would the last one. Mm -hmm. I mean, because this one has, um, you know, the decreased bladder sensation, the hypotonic. So she's got a neurogenic the bladder for for some reason. She's got decreased anal wink, so something's going on there neurologically as well. So there's not a whole lot that connects bowel and bladder, you know, other yeah. than the nervous system. So you'd be so, inclined to do it. And so I would be uh, more uh, concerned about the when I would work her up more seriously than the other one. Cormac. So another controversial one uh, like the last one, I'd be more inclined to not uh, offer an untethering for this patient. I'm, I'm mostly bothered by the lack of objective findings other than the, the, the bladder findings, which can have other explanations. Uh, uh, qu the, quick question, the, what would convince you to do it? Yeah, so uh, more uh, abnormalities on the MRI or on the neurological examination. This MRI report has been the case, I think. This, the MRI, is, this MRI is not going to change, so which neurological... No, no, I understand that. But yeah, I know, saying, but which well, neurological deterioration would you wait for before considering surgery? Well, this person presumably will not have a neurologic deterioration, I would predict, but if you mm -hmm. told me that the exam was a lot more abnormal or they had the provocative yeah. back pain or any of these other features that would be put them as sort of the classic syndrome, stays like this, I'd though. be a believer. But if it's like this, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I'm especially concerned with this, uh, you know, the neuro exam, which I would say sounds essentially normal to me. I, I get worried when I see reports like the mildly decreased anal wink and mildly increased reflexes or mildly decreased reflexes. These things, have, uh, superficially, they sound objective, but they're really not. Because if you look at, mm -hmm. again, a human population getting examined by all physicians, there's a range of reflexes that normal people yeah, are going to have. And there's the, no, a the, range the of goal of this is reflexes that people are going to To have. delve with the shade of gray, yeah. which is in the middle, which is That's obviously right. the, the battlefield over here. That's Peter. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Um, well, you know, certainly as a believer, <laughs> I have mm. to look into it. The thing is, what what concerns me a little bit is that the bladder stuff is very profound mm -hmm. versus the other elements of the triad are mm -hmm. not that bad. I mean, she has some mm -hmm. restless leg syndrome. So usually with a bladder that bad, I would also assume that the other elements of the symptoms go with it and worsen. So, so you think that if you wait long enough, the other things are going to fall into place? With a bladder so dysfunctional. No, but at that at that, that time point, mm -hmm. you know, I wouldn't. Yes, I would assume that they the bladder so bad. Also, the other things have should have gotten, yeah. you know, uh, prof more profound. But for the benefit mm -hmm. of doubt, mm -hmm. uh, with a uh, with a bladder symptoms there, I would always vote for tethered cord. Mm -hmm. well, you could you could also argue that she's 32 and she's had hydronephrosis and, and a low tone bladder and decreased sensation, you know, for her entire life, which is yeah. why the bladder is so symptomatic, you know, so I. Okay, next question is about the aerodynamics. Adult patient with new and then worsening incontinence. So it was not a patient who was incontinent throughout the life. It's kind of recent things which got worse. Um, do you request aerodynamics or not? Petra. So the dull patient, um, so do I suspect a cold tether cord based on the entire symptoms or just based on the? No, no, like we're just focusing, forget about the rest of the patient. Do you have, do you have this and you're uh -huh. suspecting uh -huh. of cold cord tethering, so I'm cutting already to the middleman. I'm just going to the last, the, the, the next thing which is the focus of the question is you suspect a cold cord tethering for all the other reasons that right now are in parentheses and out of the picture. Do you request urodynamics when you have a worsening continence in this patient who's adult? Or you are happy with that piece of information? Maybe I'm not. Uh, so, I mean, if the incontinence is the iso the only the Incontinence is there, it's getting worse. Was uh, not there before. But if there's no other symptoms of tethered cord. No, no, the, the, there are the other symptoms of tethered cord. Oh, okay, yeah. yes, so, and I request As I said, oh, you suspect to cold cord on yes, the grounds I of that plus many dynamics. other things. Yes. Do you want your dynamics? Yes. Yes. Okay, Cormac. Yeah, yes for me as well, but I mean, essentially I would send this patient to urology and ask them to do a diagnostic so you want. as they see fit, and I okay. imagine your dynamics would be part of that. Monica, you want yeah. the urodynamics? I always have the urologist screen them as well, but and evaluate them. But I'm I'm not a huge believer in urodynamics. I think that they're only really helpful in kids with really or patients with very severe urological issues because you have to have complete cooperation of the patient to get good information. You yeah. can't sedate the patient or else it alters the results. Um, you don't really see changes with urodynamics until you've got bladder injury. I mean, the, you have to have pretty significant significant bladder problems before you see it. And I'm, I usually get the VCUG, the ultrasound, and the history. And I find the history is more helpful. A good log yeah. is more helpful. Plus than, it's than operator dynamics. dependent, plus the reporting is not uniform. Mm -hmm. the, Your turn. The record. Do you order urodynamic or not? Well, I mean, I, the only reason not to get it is because you don't want to know the answer. I, um, I, 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 can't, I, I know you do. Yeah. I, and I do understand that with small children, it's scary as hell to do urodynamics, and you have to have a real reason. Um, wasn't this is an adult. adult. Yeah, that's yeah. what I said. This is an adult. Case. I can't yeah. see any reason not to do it, because no matter, the worst case scenario is you're going to understand the problem better, the, even if you can't still use that information and make a decision. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, y you have to learn something about each of the cases, and I think that mm -hmm. as much knowledge as we can get is, is the best. So I would absolutely get urodynamics. Mm -hmm. I would also like to say that the urodynamics are different depending on who does them and, where they, and, the, and the, the discussions about it. You have to learn, if you're going to do these things, if you're going to be doing these things, you actually have to learn what the words mean. Mm -hmm. Because the words don't always mean what you think okay. they mean. Mm -hmm. Next, next mm -hmm. slide goes through that. Um, the only time I get your dynamics is if I don't have anything else that that I that is objective that I can use, and I'll I'll get it maybe once a year on a kid. Oh, your no. dynamics number two slide. Your dynamics report says detrusor dyssynergia, decreased bladder sensation. The report by the urologist does not state whether or not the patient has neurogenic bladder. Do you diagnose neurogenic bladder in this case with the elements of the first two lines? Petra, go first. 
Well, you know, um, you, I was going to say, I never get the word neurogenic bladder out of a urologist, I have to mm -hmm. say, <laughs> uh, quite frank. Um, I um, uh, s stretch the truth uh, often a little bit, like Dr. Webby said, if symptoms are there, clinical symptoms that progress. Mm -hmm. uh, the, mm -hmm. I still do the bladder study just to get a baseline, like a hearing mm -hmm. test before an ear surgery. Yeah. But um, it doesn't need to be like the classical neurogenic bladder. Uh -huh. So I would say, I understand, I but in your, the, the question is, yes, given I'm those things, know. in your mind, does the yes. patient have neurogenic bladder? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Cormac. Uh, I wouldn't. If the urologist did, I, I believe No, no, no. The uh, urologist is not telling you. Yeah. And so, he's not, so re he's not returning no, the call. Uh, detrus or He's not returning the call. In your mind, does this patient have neurogenic bladder or not? Not necessarily, not okay. because of the truce or dysenergy, right. which is Monica, go next. Well, like I said, I don't do your dynamics very much, but when I do see this report, I consider that neurogenic. You've got decreased bladder sensation, so, the so there's decreased sensation, and there's decreased coordination between the sphincters, so. Okay. Dr. Eggate, yes or no? It's, <laughs> don't you ever do that to me. <laughs> no, do you see? Um, there's never going to be that. Uh, what? No, you got you to gotta say something. You can't just hedge oh. every time. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe you should hedge a little more. No, I hedge in real life. I hedge so, in real life. What is the, what's the word neurogenic Monica, bladder you means? Wait, wait, wait. I'm going to, you ask me, I'm going to give you the answer. What does neurogenic bladder mean? Neurogenic bladder means that there's a neurologic problem with the bladder that prevents it from functioning properly. It doesn't matter what they say on the, on the, on the report. It's what it is. So what you have, you have the internal sphincter, the external sphincter, the uh, sensation. Mm -hmm. We have um, the, the, the voluntary nervous system. We have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, all that have to work together perfectly. Mm -hmm. and, and in order to not have dissynergy. Dissyn I, as somebody who attended for 35 years, I've attended in spite of the clinics. And uh, the, every, every week we would talk about what the, blad, what the urodynamics meant in the spina bifida patients. I, I learned a lot and nothing. I mean, how in the world can anything that complicated be understood? So you need look to, to look for patterns. Which ones are, this is definitely a neurogenic bladder. Mm -hmm. this, is not, this is not a, 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 a difficult call. Mm -hmm. The question is, we, and, and what you describe is somebody who has abnormalities of all the four different kinds of, of, of nervous uh, intervention in, um, in, innovation in the, in the bladder occurs. It's so, so complicated that having one answer to it is very unlikely. You know, the problem with that, though, is your dynamics are interpreted by human beings that are looking at these results and using these words to put it on the report. And different technologists and different urologists have a different threshold for using these words, right? So that's we're just the words, yeah, the words that they use, the words that they use were just uh, passing the buck down the road. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. And so, no, I but we're that, the, but we're, we're, we're <laughs> it was a, like Harry Curry, Truman, Curry Harry Curry Truman, the buck stops here. <laughs> we have to have, we have to right. do the interpretation and try to counsel the patient in the what right, in what's right. right. But I guess that's what I mean, is they've already made uh, a judgment here. This is not a, necessarily an objective fact. Okay. So what, what, what is the The dysenergy. I mean, that's, that's the technologist's opinion, is what you're seeing. Mm. But the well, this is this blog, it's it's not you, you know, you, you, that's that, a sign that's not a diagnosis, though. What? That's a sign that's not a diagnosis. But it is or isn't. It's, yeah. not, it's not, well, maybe it is. It, it is. Yeah. So the aerodynamics is operator dependent. Recently, with the automatic software that they have, uh, they, at the end there is no, there is just a list of things like this, and there is no conclusion like they used to do in pen and pencil in the past. And this, uh, this illustrates, Paulo, the whole problem when you have people that that insist on getting urodynamics to make correct. the diagnosis, because even our skeptic is saying. 
you know, that then you it bounces can't, back to the GOA. You can't, that to a the, different urologist would give well, you a different answer. Yeah, right. and the recently there has been different days with two different mm -hmm. technologists. Right. One report going to say this, and the other report's going to say. But this. independently, I was talking to people who were on the uh, board of of the urologist defining what was going to be urodynamics, and three years ago they were actually having a debate about among themselves just to abolish the term neurogenic bladder uh, because there was a problem. Some people were calling it neurogenic bladder only if they were having the patient with a total spinal patient coming in with the totally gun neurogenic, uh, totally gun bladder and the catheter inside permanently. That was their threshold. Other people, they were saying, you know what, I recognize there is shades of gray, but I'm not going to call it because I don't want to be, uh, you know, have a problem with those guys where then they're going to have a problem with me. Therefore, I'm going to throw a lot of these technical terms, the truth of disenergy and whatever, which are building blocks for the diagnosis of neurogenic bladder. Other people that say neurogenic bladder all the time was for me. So they are having the same problems we're facing. So I, I want to, yeah. we, we got to get further than we have gotten in the past. Yeah. And uh, it seems now that one of the things that's coming along are, is neurostimulation. And um, it's a whole new, whole new world. And one of the things that looks interesting to me is the bladder stim stuff um, has gone for a long time and not gotten anywhere. But what is it that the bladder stimulation is doing? And, <laughs> What's being stimulated? I don't think stimulating a, 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 a skeletal muscle, a striated muscle, is going to do very much. But stimulating the vagus, not the vagus nerve, but muscle. the parasympathetic outflow from the from the conus may indeed help a lot. Okay, neurodynamics <laughs> slide number three. There are two patients. Patient XX. <laughs> Eurodynamics says more bladder, overactive detrusor, meal dyssynergia. Patient number two, patient YY says large hypotonic bladder, decreased detrusor activity, sizable postvoid residual, Petra. Which one has neurogenic bladder in your opinion? The neurologist says the urologist is unavailable for answers. <laughs> in your mind. Both do. Both. I was going to say, yeah, both. Both? Both. Formac. Both. Yeah, yeah, both. Yeah, guys. you say both. Yeah. Both. Why? Okay. Monica? Because because threshold for the both. To make Dr. Reckett? Second one could have anatomy. The Republican has the, the neurogenic bladder and the, the liberal doesn't. <laughs> They're both. They're both. They both have. Okay. And we, 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 we both are Americans. About time for somebody to start thinking that way. <laughs> All right. I think, but it, that, was a, that was on my slide, you know, in the very beginning, the yes. types of neurogenic bladder, the small spastic jumpy bladder or the large yeah, this uh, was, hypotonic bladder. These three questions had, these three slides actually had, it's like Kerbal. All the others were neutral scenarios. These were slides which were coming directly from Dr. Yamada. Now, Dr. Yamada thought, and again, his, was his opinion, uh, like the dude, uh, that urodynamics should not be used for everybody. Right. If you use sort of a tiebreaker when you have, uh, when you have some problems with the diagnosis and you have some doubts you want to verify, but once you have uh, clinical evidence on urogenic bladder, or things which are self-evident, like severe incontinence, worsening incontinence, and especially if you have fecal incontinence associated with that. In his opinion, getting the urodynamics is, was overkill. Unfortunately, it's not yet to elaborate on that, so I'm just reporting what we were discussing by email. Uh, the other thing is that I agreed that nowadays the urodynamics as a result, rarely tell you what you want to hear, which is green light neurogenic bladder or red light, you don't have it. So a lot of times you have to uh, patch the diagnosis together in your mind as a neurosurgeon. And he was seeing the truth of the synergia and decreased bladder sensation as a tantamount to neurogenic bladder, in his opinion. And um, the issue number three was agreeing with all of you that both patients had neurogenic bladder. Okay. Mm -hmm. The next section, and we're going out, were the Solansky questions. They were, those were more educational for the doctors than for the patients at this time, and I don't want to kill everybody in this room with another big section. So what I'm going to do as a gift for everybody, I'm going to send an email at the end of the morning 
with the entire set of the questions and answers between Dr. Solansky, who is a neurosurgeon from Birmingham, United Kingdom, and Dr. Yamada. They're very pointed questions, extremely clear, like a lock and razor, like analyzing the problem in the best way that I've seen it so far. And the replies of Dr. Yamada are extremely insightful for what was his what is his perception about the record. And those are like things like um, that you have to read them more than one time to get the layers into it. They're so rich. I'm going to go straight to the end. So I'm going to bypass this question. Sorry for going through it. There were about 10. So, conclusions. You have seen what, are, what is the spectrum of the opinions and what is the spectrum of the clinical presentations. Um, I'm going to read what Yamada wrote in an email a few days ago. These signs and symptoms are mainly based on elongation of the lumbar sacral canal on flexing the lumbar sacral canal, simultaneously stretching the lumbar sacral cord anchored by an inelastic film or anomaly. Phylum, it was misspelled. Okay. The definitive MRI sign is the posterior displacement of the phylum and also of the conus. So he believed that many other things in the MRI can be seen, not seen, like the fatty phylum, the thick phylum, but the posterior displacement of the phylum, the posterior displacement, the posterior post displacement of the conus, that these was, were present in virtually 100% of the patient with terracor. So this is kind of his gift to us in the fine analysis of the MRI. Uh, his last, one of the last things that he wrote in June 28 was, Dr. Bolognese, Dr. Kula, and I are confident in an epoch-making su success in this respect by our TCS session. Sincerely, Shokei Yamada. Thank you very much.